I'm Bill Calkins with Ball Tech On Demand, and I'm thrilled to be joined on this video discussion by Dr. Todd Cavins. Todd is one of the technical services experts at Ball Seed, and he's been helping professional growers solve greenhouse production challenges for more than 10 years in the field. And before that, he was a professor at Oklahoma State University. With more than 15 years experience traveling North America and around the world, Working with growers, Todd's a trusted resource when it comes to researching and advising on real-world problems that affect daily plant production. Welcome, Todd. Hey, thanks, Bill. Great to be with you today. Cool. So we are actually here today to talk about best practices related to transplanting. So I guess first off, why is this topic important? And I'm guessing you've seen a lot of mistakes that folks have made leading to some challenges down the road when it comes to transplanting. So can you tell us a little bit about why you want to share transplanting tips and tricks? Well, I've seen some mistakes. I've also seen a lot of great success. And that's what I want to share today is some of those successes I've seen uh, from some really great growers out there and just talk about what they did to, uh, to be successful with their transplants. You know, most of us in the greenhouse industry, we're not necessarily seeding our own seed or we're not rooting our own liner. So most of us are bringing in uh, plugs and rooted liners. And so it is a critical aspect of, uh, of our production. And the day we get those products in, that's when we start having our influence on them and the success of our crops in the coming weeks. So that's why it's critical. Excellent. And, and I know that uh, we talked a little bit that you have five tips and tricks that you actually work on with growers, probably growers of any skill level. It's probably not, uh, not a bad idea if you're an expert grower to go back and, and review these before transplant time, uh, but also for any of the newer growers in your organization, this might be a, a really uh, good lesson. Um, and it boils down to five uh, tips and tricks. <laughs> yeah, no matter how experienced you are as a grower, the plants still kind of like the same thing. They like to be treated right. So yeah, let's get into these five and talk about them. Sounds good. I think that, uh, that, that that sets the stage. So let's start with tip number one, which is inspecting incoming young plants and getting them into production as quickly as possible. As you say, do not delay. So can you elaborate and explain why this is so important? Yeah, so let's talk about this. You know, um, at Ball Seed, I know we work really um, strongly with our plug growers and our rooting stations to deliver the best product possible. Um, they deal with some of the same challenges that everybody else deals with. You know, sometimes the weather's not perfect. It's been too rainy. There's no sunshine. So things don't always go perfect. So we want to make sure that those plugs and liners are on target, that they're sized up correctly. They've got the right amount of internodes stacked nicely, got the brakes coming out. So we want to know what we're working with in the first place, right? Because I may need to treat my production, tweak my production just a little bit. Maybe I need to feed them a little bit more. Maybe I need to get them in a warmer area. You know, so inspecting those plugs and liners when they come in, taking a look at them and making sure that they are what you expect. Now, not only from a plant quality aspect, but let's also think about a plant health aspect as well. You know, pull some of those plugs and liners out, make sure the roots are healthy, inspect the foliage, make sure there's no pest and disease in there. Um, and we want you to do that as soon as you get them. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, if we do have a problem somewhere in the supply chain, we wanna get the opportunity to get back and get that corrected as soon as possible. And if for some reason there's a problem and we may need to replace plants, we need to know that day so we can get you taken care of if we need to take different actions. So time is critical on that. And um, not only that for some of those business reasons and getting yourself ready, but it's also for the plant health because delaying transplanting is generally not a good idea for most crops. That makes a lot of sense. So do you want to uh, maybe share a little bit of the, the common issues that you see? Um, uh, some, of, some of the challenges that you see when, when growers do delay? Absolutely. Let me show you a, a few slides here of something that I see from time to time. And it's when growers try to hold plugs, okay? They get them in, I don't have time, or for whatever reason, they don't get transplanted. How does that affect the finished product that they receive. So here I'm showing you a slide of some easy wave neon petunias, okay? Now these were grown, uh, sown in a very warm area. Uh, so we're looking at pictures that are taken 45 days after sowing the seed. Uh, this particular one you can see on your left, these were transplanted at age 25. So just about three weeks after sowing, these plugs were ready to transplant, okay? 
We waited 10 days later and transplanted the next set, okay? And then another 10 days, which is the day these photos were essentially taken. So you can see there's some developmental differences between these three pictures. Those on your left that were transplanted early, lots of vegetative growth, lots of good branching, filling out the container, that's what we wanna see. In the middle, hey, doesn't look bad at all, even got a few flowers there. But on your right hand side, when we transplant them late, what happened to those guys? They sat in the plug flat too long. They started to get chlorotic because we just couldn't get enough feed on them. They started to stretch. And you can see the flowering here is occurring from stress. So while they're maybe a little bit earlier based on flowering, they're definitely not the product we want to see on our bench or when we hang those baskets up. So that's one of the things that we see when we delay plugs too long. They get root bound, they get hard to get hard to feed into the plug stage itself, okay? Also, we can get some disease in there. Botrytis tends to sneak in there uh, when that happens. So that is what you see there, and that's 45 days after sowing. So let's now add a few more days to that. So if you'll take a look at the next slide, here's a week later, here's what those plants look like. So again, those that are transplanted on time, we see them coming into flower in the back of the picture there on your day 25 photos. But look just how robust and filled that container is. That's what we want. Those that were day 35 there in the center, remember they didn't look too bad a week ago. But man, now that here we're getting, uh, you know, another week out, we can really start to see the de development of delays that occurred. And it's really going to affect our finished crop time and our finished crop quality. And then there on the right, again, those that were transplanted the latest, we are just going to struggle and struggle and struggle to get those caught up. Those are going to need an additional two to three weeks beyond uh, what our other crops need. So that's why transplanting on time is important. Getting root bound, getting disease, getting behind nutritionally, there's a cost. And it, that cost lingers uh, in, in slow crop development for several weeks later. That makes sense. And, you know, I've heard it said many times that uh, you, anything that you can do early on to keep that crop healthy is going to avoid all sorts of problems down the line. And, and, and it, you see it right there in the pictures. I think that uh, that's a really good, really good lesson and a really good visual. So your second tip revolves around a preventative fungicide application. So can you talk a little bit about your reasons for suggesting this and is it always necessary? Well, this is one that there's always a little bit of debate on, but if you read your fungicide labels and talk to the disease experts out there, all fungicides are essentially preventative fungicides, all right? So we need to put them on there before the disease outbreaks. But one of the things I want to question, think about a little bit, see if it works for you, is should you be applying fungicide in this plug and liner stage before you transplant? Now, when I work with plug growers and rooting stations, we always try to apply a fungicide just prior to ship so that that plant is protected for several weeks after it leaves the plug or rooting station, okay? So that, so in a sense, we do have them protected, but if you have a high risk crop, a crop you've struggled with, you have uh, poor conditions, you know, say you get your plugs and liners and it's rainy, it's cold, you know that you're gonna struggle, you may wanna consider doing a fungicide application in the plug flat before you transplant or just after transplant. Couple of interesting things. If you apply it in the plug flat, there's a big cost savings on volume of fungicide, the amount of time and labor it takes to apply it. If you think about a 512 plug tray versus treating, you know, all the baskets that those 512 may fill, fill that's a big difference in time and effort. So it can be, uh, it can be uh, ad advantageous for several reasons. Now, are there considerations? Absolutely. Um, if you're going to apply fungicides in that plug and liner stage, you need to think about your employee health and safety, number one, okay? If, they're gonna have, if you're going to have employees handling those plugs and liners that day, the following day, you know, um, we always have the restricted reentry intervals. So you need to think about and take a look at the options and what's required for uh, personal protection equipment so that those employees are safe. Um, we also want to take a look and maybe if you're going to do this, you need to reach out to your plug grower and we can do that through our ball seed uh, uh, group as well and find out what fungicides they've applied. 
And the reason why is we want to maintain a good fungicide rotation. There's that information on the FRAC group or the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee they've, where they've gone in and categorized how fungicides work. And this one, just because it has a different name doesn't mean it doesn't work exactly the same as this one. So we want to rotate those so we don't get a buildup of resistance. So that's important. Then there can also be some phytotoxicity concerns. We may not want to apply the exact same fungicide just 14 days apart from another one. So it's a strategy to think about with cost savings, but you do need, need to do your research and make sure you're in tune with your plug-in rooting station so that you do that safely. That's good. And I've actually heard that tip uh, any number of times from, uh, from, from you guys about, you know, making sure that you know what, what that plug grower is putting on those crops before you receive them so that you're not missing something or, or doubling up where you shouldn't be. So we always talk about the importance of irrigation during all crop stages. It's sort of a mantra, I think, within the uh, Ball Technical Services team. And, and it's actually your third tip here for transplanting. So why is moisture at transplant so important when you're starting the crops? And how can this help reduce damage and losses? I know that um, we've talked a little bit about damage and loss even with dislodging. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we'll talk about irrigation in just a few moments, but yeah, let's talk about how moist are those plugs and liners when it's time to transplant them. You know, uh, we'll talk about that one to five watering scale where five is saturated and one is bone dry. And so where do you want your plugs and liners to be to transplant them? Well, you don't want them to be soaking wet because that's messy. The plug may, the root ball may fall apart a little bit, but you don't want them bone dry either because you may do some damage when you dislodge them from the plug flat. So I find that you know a good solid three, maybe a slightly dry four on that one to five watering scale generally works pretty good for transplanting. It may depend on what type of equipment you have, how you dislodge them, uh, but you know somewhere a little bit moist is where we want to keep them. That also translates into a healthy plant. Uh, we never want to transplant dry plugs. We see this quite a bit in pansies as, as we look into the fall, uh, the late summer early fall pansy production season, if a plug grower transplants a dry pansy plug, boy, they just really suffer. You get root damage and it takes them weeks and weeks to recover. So target a three or four on that um, irrigation scale for transplanting. As I mentioned, I want to say again, also dislodging them. Don't pull the plugs or liner out by the stem. We want to dislodge them from the bottom. You can make this as simple as a, you know, a one by two strip with some nails to uh, poking through it to poke, push plants out of the cells. There's also some great equipment out there, uh, like a plug popper, which you can put a hole flat on, step on the panel, and all your plugs are dislodged safely from the bottom. And then, of course, there's the automated transplanters that are gaining a lot of popularity, even with small growers, because of the labor savings and the quality of the transplant. That's good. And I've actually seen uh, the, the ball technical team answering some questions from growers as the crops further along saying, well, why, you know, why, what's this problem from what caused this? And sometimes the answer is check the way that, uh, that those plugs were, were transplanted because if they were really damaged and, you know, as they went into that pot, then that, that could cause some pretty significant problems yeah. down the line. Damage coming out of the tray or damage going into the pot, either one. Yes, we've seen both of that, unfortunately. So let's go on to tip number four, which is related to feeding the recent transplants. Um, talk a little bit about feeding out of the gate and other good practices for keeping the transplants healthy and growing. And I think you're going to go through kind of a, a proven method or, or a method that you've seen have success uh, in a lot of greenhouse operations. Yeah, I'll share uh, some things I see that work. But uh, one thing to consider about plugs and liners when you get them in. Um, that is a very challenging uh, stage of production, and that's why we tend to have fewer growers who are plug-in liner growers, uh, just because it's challenging. Um, it's very difficult <laughs> to get a plant to actively grow, yet keep it nice and compact and toned to make, you know, hundreds and hundreds fit in a, a, a flat size. So um, a lot of those plugs and liner growers, they adjust their nutrition to help maintain the plants just, just so. Um, and what they tend to do is they tend to limit a little bit of the macronutrients, so the nitrogen and potassium a little bit, maybe a little bit of the phosphorus too, but they often always have to supplement with micronutrients to keep those up. So my point is here, those exact details aren't that critical, but the point is, is that those plugs don't necessarily have the most optimum feed for finishing growth and development in a finished container. So we need to think about that 
and what do we need to do to get those plugs off and running? So um, let's uh, take a look at a little study that was done long, years ago, but it looked at some plugs that were, they were actually pretty old. They were getting old, they were needed feed, they were a little bit chlorotic, and they took those unfertilized plugs and they transplanted them out into some packed material, into some packed containers. They then took some of those same plugs from those same plug trays, fertilized those with a big shot of uh, fertilizer, and this is 400 parts per million from a 201020, transplanted them out and then watered them in with the same fertilizer. So they essentially uh, got a really good dose of 201020 fertilizer at transplanting. Now I mentioned 201020 um, because that's, uh, that's um, intentional at this point. I almost always suggest that your fertilizer choice is based on your water quality, namely alkalinity is what we often look at. But this is one of those situations where, you know, if it's just one irrigation, uh, we can get away with maybe it not being the perfect choice for our water quality. But I chose 201020 based on the ammonium to nitrate nitrogen ratio. So nitrogen generally comes, it comes in three forms, but we generally talk about it two forms as the way the plant sees it. And the 201020 has about 30 to 40% of this ammoniacal or ammon ammonium type fertilizer. And the reason that's important is because that gives the plants a little extra push, a little extra stretch. That type of nitrogen is almost never used in the plug and liner stage. And so that's why I'm talking about how those plug and liner growers tweak their nutrition a little bit. They use this nitrate nitrogen that keeps them very tight and toned, still lets the plant grow, develop, and develop correctly but it doesn't give it lush growth. So when we're getting those products in, let's think about using a, something with a little bit more ammoniacal nitrogen to give them a boost of lush growth. So we did these two different treatments with these plugs and let's take a look at the pictures to show you uh, what happened. Now this is a little bit messy, but what I want you to concentrate on is the, the right hand side of each of these pictures. So you see above the red line uh, that those plugs were, those were the fertilized plugs I talked about. And the, below the red line, those were the untreated or just irrigated in and watered in with clear water. So let's concentrate on the top right hand side of this picture on day three. Those are the petunias that you see in the top right hand picture. And down below it there at day three, you can't really tell much of a difference between the fertilized and unfertilized. But now let's move over to this day five picture. We're really starting to see a difference between those plugs on top that were given fertilizer versus those down below that weren't, okay? And then at day seven is when we see a really big difference. Look at those petunias in the top right corner. They're filling out their tray. Um, you've got leaves to the edge. Those guys are really moving along. And then down below the line, those guys have hardly expanded at all. So that's that one shot, essentially one, one and a half, two shots of fertilizer you can see seven days ago makes a big difference. So that makes a big difference on how well your plants fill out. Um, yes, we're gonna need to be concerned about how well they fill out. Do I have to start applying plant growth regulators? And that is a concern, but remember, we've gotta get these plugs up and growing. We've gotta get the roots out there. We've gotta get them very healthy. So a little shot of extra ammonium, uh, if you're not currently using an ammonium fer uh, a fertilizer with, uh, a decent amount of ammonium can really help. Good, excellent tips, excellent tips. So. Moving on, sort of last but not least is, we referenced it earlier, but irrigation management throughout all the early stages. So what are the watering details that growers should remember to avoid all sorts of problems down the line? And I will say that you talked a little bit about the one to five water scale. I will put links to a podcast that I did with your uh, your cohort, Will Healy, on uh, the watering table. And uh, it's a really in-depth, actually two-part series to um to uh to go through all that so i will uh put that into the show notes or the description in youtube but why don't you talk a little bit about the irrigation scale and and how growers can use that um, effectively in transplanting yeah so really delving into those uh presentations you spoke just spoke about is really worth your time um let me give you the extreme short cliff notes version of it okay um when we talk about the watering scale on your left on that slide, if you'll look closely at the screen, you can see that you'll see that that plug or that transplant uh, there on the left, we're labeling it as a five. And if you look closely, it's pretty shiny. You can see free water starting to come out of that 
uh, out of that root ball as we've taken it out of the cell pack, okay? So that's a five, that's saturated. For the most part, we want to avoid that level of saturation for general production, okay? Um, the reason is it just takes too long to dry back out, then we start to get into some root rot problems and things like that. Maybe if it's summertime, late spring, early, or in the summertime, maybe a five is okay because you know it's going to dry out rapidly. But as we move across the screen, you'll see that four, three, two, and then we get all the way down to a one. When you look closely at that one, what do you see? Well, the top is dry, okay, and that's an important thing, but what's more important is how dry or how moist is the, the entire soil column of that pack. So um, one is a little bit too dry for most situations. You can see on that one that it's very, very dry at the top and there's gonna be no root growth. When you see that, that's when the soil is actually sh shrinking away from the edge. So a little too dry in my opinion. So what is my recommendation for irrigation? Generally, when you wet a plug in, okay, when you wet a transplant in, I like to go up to a stage four, okay? Stage four, think about this. We're getting enough water on there that we've got the soil column nice and wet. We've got good contact with the plug and the roots to the new soil column, and we're just getting a drop or two out of the bottom of the container, okay? Nice and moist, good contact, but not saturated. Then what do I want to do? I want to let that dry down till I get to that stage two. On that stage two, the soil will be visibly lighter in color for the most part, although you shouldn't just go by color and appearance, you should actually pick it up and weigh it, okay? And that's when we know when we get down to that two, we've got the water taken up by the plant or evaporation, we've got lots of good oxygen down in that soil column, that's when roots really start to thrive. So when I cycle from the four down to the two, and that's what I want to encourage you to look at when you're doing your irrigation methods is four to a two, cycle from a four to a two. I've seen tremendous uh, enhancement in root growth when growers follow that strategy. Excellent. And just remember what Todd said, you can't go by color. You've got to pick those trays up and weigh them, weigh those flats. And uh, it, it, it might sound like it's going to be a hassle, but once you do it a few times and you start establishing that baseline, it's going to be such a key tool for your entire operation and a great way to train all your entire growing staff. So I think that we can go ahead and, and end there. You've given us these fantastic five tips and tricks. Um, I'm sure that the listeners need to get back into the greenhouse. So hopefully these tips are going to help your entire production team stay on track when you receive those young plants. Because as we've said, anything you can do early on to keep those fresh transplants healthy is going to really pay off down the road. So it's best to invest the time and energy at the onset versus trying to identify and solve all these problems further down the line. So Todd, is there anything you want to add before we close for now? Well, I just want to say, you know, I've given some general information here. There's always going to be a few crops specifically that like to be treated a little bit different. One of those I'll share with you that I just want to caution you on is the, vinca, the bedding plant vinca. I mentioned fungicide early on. Um, it's one that in our, some of our trials, it really doesn't like to be fungicide early. So, and it also is a tricky one that doesn't like to go all the way up to a four very well. So it'd be a very dry four that you would water that in. So take these tips and tricks, work them out in your own situation and set in settings and make them work for you and find out what crops you'll go work with. I think you'll find that about 98% of the crops do great with this type of strategy. Excellent and good to keep an eye on that finca maybe not an early fungicide on that one. So thank you so much. It's been such great and useful information and really clear methods to follow, which I think uh, everyone appreciates. So thanks so much, Todd. And to the viewers and listeners, I do want to remind you about a, a resource, a, a relatively new resource that's uh, available these days, um, you know, fitting right into, uh, into a community and peer-to-peer approach. It's the Greenhouse Tech Team, which is a closed Facebook group. It is moderated by Ball, um, but has more than a thousand members around the world. There are all sorts of tips and tricks related to plant production. There's 23 different topic threads you can explore, but one of the features I definitely want to point out is the Ask the Expert feature, where you can actually share a question or photos of the crops in your greenhouse and get answers very quickly, sometimes within an hour. You'll get answers from the experts at Ball and, and other uh, technical experts, university folks and academics are, are on this and uh, on this site and quick to uh, answer questions. And you'll get peer-to-peer -peer comments. You'll get comments from growers who might have seen the exact same thing in their greenhouse in the past. So 
all you have to do to engage with the Greenhouse Tech Team is to search Greenhouse Tech Team in Facebook. You're gonna get a couple of qualifying questions that if you're a Horde professional, you will have no problem answering, and uh, then you'll be welcome to the community. So I uh, encourage you to check out the Greenhouse Tech Team for sure. And Todd, thanks again. And on behalf of Ball Technical Services, Ball Tech On Demand, definitely get those plans started strong and healthy. You'll solve, you'll solve all sorts of problems down the road and uh, take care out there. All right, thanks for having me, Bill.